Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, a Monday edition, a vacation edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden on the 18th of November, 2019. Okay, I forgot to put the episode number in our intro. It's episode 551. I can't believe we made it this far. As you can see, I'm not in my studio. I'm at the uh, uh, property we have right outside of Disney. We're going on a little vacation as soon as I'm done recording and uploading this episode. But I thought we need to conti- keep some continuality. If we have George recording from St. Bart's, I have no excuse not to record from uh, my little uh, vacation villa down here in Florida. Uh, let's start off. Gavin, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing very well indeed. Thank you, Kevin. It's, mm-hmm. um, uh, it, it, we're, we're heading into an election. The, the news is wonderfully entertaining. Instead of having to watch politics, we're watching Prince Andrew single-handedly try and destroy the royal family, the English <sighs> constitution. <laughs> and and it's, it's providing enormous entertainment. We have this this television program called The Crown, where they're where they're doing a drama of the last um, fifty years, and none of it's as entertaining as the real thing. Which Prince Well, Andrew, no, it's amazing. His, he should have showed up on camera with his head on his head uh, forehead, saying, "I'm guilty." You know, it it just oh, it was so pitiful to watch. Um, however, George, you're now the famous priest from St. Bart's. Well, it's quite quite fun. We had a uh, we had a jet setting wedding of uh, 250 people on Saturday, and already the paparazzi photos have appeared in People and, and in the Daily Mail, and and I've read in great detail all the, about all these people who attended the service. And there's even one photo of me in my cassock greeting some models, and it looks rather uh, uh, I don't know. It, it just cries out for some sort of clever caption it did uh, for, for me it, it said one of these things don't belong together from the sesame street days it was a, a an amazing uh, a, a pic photo of you so well ac- actually no it, i i was yes on one level but no to see god at work among people of all types and of all backgrounds yep. is just extraordinarily exciting um the w- it, here's a funny thing the, the wedding i did before this for Two people in their early 20s just about want to beat the baby getting into town. Uh, but, uh, you know, very poor country people. And today, this last week, where millions of dollars were spent on throwing this wedding celebration, yet the same things happened, the same words were said, the same spirit was present. And that's the wonderful thing about being a priest, because you work with people in all situations. Well, and to bring them into the presence of God. You were telling us in the pre-show that uh, they had container ships or containers off ships brought in for the wedding. Yes, 13 containers uh, of goods and flowers and uh, you know, the, the florists. The, we had seven wedding photographers inside the building, plus a videographer, plus a man at the sound booth. Um, and therefore, I decided to give him a good old-fashioned... Uh, Jesus Christ, uh, repent, the kingdom of God is drawn near. Your love is based upon the love of God for you, and if that is not central in your life, your love will soon wither and fade away. Uh, great stuff. Uh, and here's a funny thing. Uh, as the service end, after it ended, I greeted people, because there's only one exit. It's through the front gate, stone walls, and you have the paparazzi on all sides t- with their photos. And I, here were a group of people... I met my first Russian oligarch. I met a Miss Universe. And I met a lot of people my age and older, and several of them just stopped to tell me that they needed to hear that message. Uh, And that the young girls, the professional models, needed to know that there was more to life than just pretty things and shiny objects. And so I I guess I took the gamble, because if I blew it, uh, I'd never be invited (laughs) back to the island. But... Preaching the good news, I think, in season and out is uh, is a wonderful mm. opportunity and obligation. Before we get into the news, what are your, some of your responsibilities on the island as the, a visiting priest? Well, uh, weddings, funerals, pastoral counseling. Uh, I open the church every morning and close it every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, tourists come, knock on the uh, 
presbyter's door and asked me to give them tours and I've been doing pastoral. Basically, I'm working full time and Susan is asleep and my daughter arrived uh, this weekend. So we'll probably go to the beach for more than just, uh, you know, just a few hours one of these days. But for me, it's the idea vacation because I'm not on vacation. I just get to play in somebody else's job. That's great. Um, I want the, the news out there is, is crazy like every week. There's election news, there's political news and stuff like that. Uh, I saw another person has been banned from Facebook because they oppose the transgender uh, religion that's been going on. And I, you guys know who uh, Camille Poligli... I can't pronounce it. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Her last name. Uh, she is one of these feminists who's who's opposes this whole transgendered ideology and says we need to stop. This will destroy feminism. This will destroy everything if we let it go forward. And I thought this is a great chance to talk about it because I'm waiting for the first headline. It hasn't appeared yet in any paper. If it has, somebody send me the link where a transgendered male or a female has been transgendered from male to female demands an abortion you know we we now have the, the uh they're demanding access to gynecologists and all that but uh it's really getting crazy and i think it's time to talk about it to the point we get banned on youtube ourselves uh i want to start off with you gavin because some of this craziness is coming from england yes it is um it's always helpful when secular people tell the truth in an unashamed way mm -hmm. and, and you can recognize the truth without there being issues of denominational or spiritual or tribal uh, allegiance. And the reason I bring that up is because there's a, a very gutsy blonde lady in her late 40s called Posey Parker. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's her real name. That's her stage uh, name. She's um, a very um, gutsy feminist and she's been leading a feminist group of some notoriety and has been thrown off all the feminist groups and and has announced she's withdrawing and stopping calling herself a feminist after a lifelong allegiance with it because of the fight with trans issues and the reason this is important for us is she's making exactly the same arguments as we are making uh, but in an entirely factual way in other words the truth is the truth is the truth whether or not it is is part of a package of revelation or whether you experience it outside revelation um, and uh, one of the, the the lines of argument she's been pursuing is she absolutely refuses to to give trans men women pronouns and she says that because in the end it ends up with with men taking away women's space and particularly the space in women's bathrooms where she has a 14 year old adolescent daughter and she wants her daughter to be safe from being invaded by men and the reason that she's withdrawing from being a feminist is that she's beginning to say she's she's recognized that 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 the precepts of feminism have led to this situation in other words it was rotten from the beginning as a philosophy and it had unlooked for consequences now this is quite interesting because a number of us have been saying the same thing theologically to the church for some time and we've been very frustrated because people refused to give any thought to the idea that gender might have a role not only in revelation but in the way in which we work our christian community and everyone's been look, pointing to us traditionalists and saying no you're just bigots you're you just belong to an old-fashioned culture that time has passed you by <laughs> And we've been trying to say, no, there are really are consequences that will unfold a very dramatic and serious kind if you don't work out what the implications of the theology and the reality of gender are. So since people haven't been listening to us very much, it's a huge relief to have Posey Parker, a gutsy, secular feminist woman, say, effectively, these guys were right. Um, and uh, one of the things she's doing is blowing up some of the presuppositions so in the face of critics who are saying uh, this is gender dysphoria she's saying well it, it isn't gender it isn't even gender dysphoria because if it was it would happen to men and women equally and there are no women in their 40s suddenly discovering that they're men and wanting to adopt fake penises in the way that there is a whole raft of men in their 40s wanting to identify as women and then to have surgery uh, with it and so uh, she's been banned from everything. She's been 
ba banned from Facebook. Facebook uh, well, YouTube, she's still, sure. Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah. But I think one of the reasons this matters is because in the news we have, for example, this week, we have got two examples where in Austria there is a, a leading liberal Catholic um, clerical figure who has presided over a gay blessing on the grounds that he's still doing the pre Posey Parker, you know, nothing to see here. This is equality, inclusion, love, well, warmth and welcome. It will change nothing. And in, and in Spain, we have a Roman Catholic priest who very much likes his Anglican woman uh, counterpart to the extent where he's invited her to stand around the altar. And then the, 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 his bishop has blown up and said, what on earth do you think you're doing? This is very serious, both in terms of bad theology and bad church discipline. And he scratches his head and says, I just like her. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. I'm so sorry. And what we have is um, we we have we have on, on the Hung on the Aust Austrian side, we have people who know exactly what they're doing and are pr pr pursuing a progressive agenda without, I think, understanding the Posey Parker consequences. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have in Spain an ignorant man just trying to be friendly and not having done any theology or thought his position through. Here in America, we've had the same thing. Down in Texas, we had a case where a, a mother wanted her son to be uh, made into a uh, or castrated so she could become a girl it went to court the father fought it he lost in court um, however it made national news international news and finally uh, the governor stood in and said hey we're going to investigate this further and you know that case is now being not retried but you know something else is happening george uh it's not just england it's america that's crazy yeah well i uh, guess some background on some of the items we spoke about sure uh, the director of family life in the catholic uh, archdiocese of graz uh which is a high functionary he's the one who is the priest who basically leads the who supervises the marriage and the family and the catechetical everything to do with family uh, this this Catholic priest went to the neighboring diocese of Klagenfurt, where he had also held that office before getting kicked upstairs, and he performed a marriage uh, or a nuptial blessing of two women in the church with Eucharist and the full show. And he could do this because in the diocese of Klagenfurt, it's without a bishop. And therefore, the only person who could, who could discipline him uh, isn't in office yet. So this very, uh, very clever Catholic priest, he didn't do it in his own diocese. He didn't do it in Graz, where he would have been immediately nailed. He did it where in a vacuum. And he did it, and it was permitted to have photographs. So there are photographs floating around the internet. So this was not some sort of uh, uh, secret thing done for the true believers in their, in their closet. This was a deliberate provocation with photos uh, sent to the world and by a priest who for at least six months is going to be free of any jeopardy. And so the, so the, what we're going to see is we're going to see other liberal Catholics in Germany and Austria wait and see if anything happens to this priest. And if nothing happens, if there's no discipline, we're going to see more of these rebellions. Now the case Gavin cited in uh, the Diocese of Malaga in southern Spain a Catholic priest invited a retired Anglican priest, a woman named Jenny Lancaster, uh, who holds a PTO from the Diocese of Newcastle in Northern England, to stand behind the altar and come celebrate the Eucharist with her on All Souls Day or All Saints Day, one of, one of those two days. And this, the diocese discovered this once again, again through social media. But this time around, the diocese acted quickly issued a statement saying, here is why this is wrong according to canon law and church teaching. And the priest put out a statement, a public statement of repentance and contrition. But it started off by saying, I know Jenny Lancaster, she's a lovely <laughs> woman. I didn't think there was anything wrong, but I've been informed I, I did something bad. And for that, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. So, so here we have, so what is that? You have two things sort of percolating. One is rebellion, and the other is ignorance within the Catholic world. And, you, and that's not just within the Catholic world. Anglo Episcopal clergy are the most ignorant theological people I've ever met. Uh, 
but there's a the catechetical education is all but dead in at least, I know in my denomination certainly is dead in the formation of this Spanish priest and you couple that with deliberate rebellion the spirit of the age is really rearing its head right now um, there's another example of, of the way in which secular society um, is is demonstrating to us a, a profound truth and that is in English universities they have done uh, questionnaires about freedom of speech and what they've discovered is that, that on the whole women who are dominating our universities with, in, in at least in terms of numbers women don't like freedom of speech because it's intellect that it engenders they are um, as Jordan Peterson would say, they, 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 they want to get along by pleasing and cooperating. And one of the ways in which you do that is you, you, you don't make space for problematic assertions that make people uncomfortable. So what we've done is because men and women are different, um, our laboratories of discovery, freedom of speech is being quashed by the difference between men and women. Um, and and where did we where did we hear this long ago? Well, C.S. Lewis wrote this really excellent paper saying, "Here are some reasons why you shouldn't have women clergy." In that, if women represent icon iconographically God, and you begin to pray to our Mother, you end up with a with a God who has entirely different characteristics. So what we discover now, both in the world of of university and democracy and in the church, and that takes us on to Pacamama, the use of gender takes you into two completely different directions in terms of values and the way in which uh, human beings function. So some of us have been trying to say this theologically for the last 20 years, but the chickens are coming home to roost in secular society, meaning that it's being proved in terms of the way in which people are working out their experience with gender in secular contexts. Now, if I just may jump in on one factual point, the Texas case was badly reported because it was reported first off that the father lost his battle to prevent his son from being castrated. That's right, yeah. That's not true. The father was seeking sole custody okay. and because the mother wanted to, felt this was what the child wanted and the court declined to give him sole custody they gave them joint custody with each having a veto over the medical treatment of the other. So in a, so in a lawyerly way, the father won because the, unless the father concedes that his son may be castrated, the child won't be castrated. The Texas governor got involved and the Texas Department of Family and Children got involved because of the campaigning aspect of transgender activists to sort of say, let's mutilate this child uh, for ideological reasons, not for the best interest of the children. So uh, th there was a bit of hyperbole in that Texas case, but at the same time, it's a t dreadful situation. And I think the mother's a nut job, but. Well, he clearly, oh. in our unprofessional opinion, yes, uh, she certainly has some issues. And you know, just that's the family of the 21st century now. You know, many families are broken families, are uh, families of at least a, a divorce within the first couple of years. Uh, w my kids went to school, even in a Roman Catholic uh, school situation, parochial school, where many of their friends, 70%, were from broken families, where there was divorce or there was um, uh, some type of situation where they're living with grandparents. Um, so even in you know, Christian context, uh, it's broken and this is a great opportunity for the church but the church is broken now too and a, well, the a, a, a broken church cannot serve well a broken society Gavin and we're a very long way behind the curve I mean mm -hmm. even dear Posey Parker says that on every feminist group she tries to belong to on the internet there are 20 transgendered angry men there ready to shout down anyone who denies their rights and she says well you know but you have there are no rights you don't have it's not rights you lack mm -hmm. what you're bringing is a kind of bullying mentality here and when asked uh, what the next struggle was going to be she's been repeating exactly what we've been saying and that is the sex children it's pedophilia 
So we, we, we have people, sensible, intelligent people with their feet on the ground in secular society warning that progressive culture uh, is progressing in exactly the same way that, that we said it was too. And my great concern is that Christians won't do anything about it. In Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner this last week, we had one of these rather eccentric public speakers uh, who has put up a little banner around him on, on a footstool he stands on, and it says the blood of Christ. Uh, in, in it's, about, it's about as tall as he is. It, it acts like a kind of booth to the left and right and behind him and says the blood of Christ. And two policemen came down and said, that's offensive. We're taking it down. Give us your property. Um, and, and to which his, his answer was, was, since when did the words the blood of Christ in a public space in Britain become so offensive? that the police have become involved. The police turned up and interviewed Posey Parker because she she had used language that the trans activists had reported in great detail. And then the police sat down during this interview and read out to her about 25 minutes of the trans history of trying to find his or herself. And she, she, she had a lawyer who said, don't say anything, no comment all the way through. We're, we're, we're moving into really problematic times and I, I feel such a strong urge to say to our, our, our bishops and our leaders, you must wake up and begin to speak the truth and of Christianity because we're losing the last vestiges of our purpose and influence. Now, there is, there, if, I, if I just had, I agree with all of the Gavin says, but I have a different outlook. Uh, well, I've, maybe I have a different hope, perhaps. I see that the market is doing its work. Procter & Gamble, the uh, giant uh, consumer goods company had to take an eight billion, that's billion with a B, right down this year because it decided to go, because it decided to feminize its men's razor blade division. Had these, Good. And even had, uh, even had an ad of, a fa you know, it started to, it became woke. It began to lecture men about their sins. And even had an ad on Facebook of a father teaching his transgendered son how to shave his legs. Well, the result was they lost eight billion dollars. Go woke, go broke. <laughs> all, all, the, all the companies that do not have monopoly power that have gone woke have lost huge amounts of money. What is the most successful for fast food franchise in the United States? Chick-fil-A. McDonald's, Burger <laughs> King, Wendy's, all of those who have played to the spirit of the age they're not doing as well as Chick-fil-A. The market is in the United States is, who is the bell tolling for? It's tolling for Procter and Gamble. <laughs> so, but here's the thing, when you have monopolies in place, like Facebook, like Twitter, like the BBC, like the mass media in the United States, that does not allow for free competition of ideas, then these evil, and they are evil, these evil ideas, are not challenged or defended and defeated in the in the courts of reason. So it's so when capitalism works, it sorts out the nonsense. But when you have monopolies, uh, when you have uh, coercion in the market, it doesn't work. There, that's my. I little think that's a f ten no, minutes I, of treatment. I mean, that, that's I think that's a. Well, okay, l l let me let the audience know. There's, I'm on Disney Wi-Fi real slow. It's not my home Wi-Fi. It's not the home internet where I, I can download 500 billion gazillions a second. Here I get basically SOS speed. Doop, 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 doop. It's real slow. Morse code. <laughs> so sometimes Gavin's been kind of uh, uh, freezing up. George has been freezing up. I'm sure people watching this are going, Kevin, you're freezing up. It's just the technologically issues we have when we do vacation videos. I wanted to add, you know, I'm from Connecticut, and we have a, a, a case going to the Supreme Court of Connecticut where female athletes in high school who've been training and training and training in track um, to get college scholarships uh, have been very disappointed to find out that uh, men who say they're fem feminine or females are allowed to compete with them. And so much so that the men have competed in one the top three women's scholarships uh, given out in Connecticut 
uh, for track and field. And they're going to go to these colleges now with the, the women, the money that was to be given to the female athletes, um, and compete at the college level. And the scholastic colleges here in America have no trouble uh, letting you declare what your gender is. And this is just going to be perpetuated in the universities here in America. I don't know what it's like in Europe, but it can't be much better. Well, I love I love the fact that George is offering capitalism as our as our savior. Um, I have no difficulty with that at all. I, I I still prefer Jesus, but I'm but I'm happy to let them both work. In. I would really love to think George is right. I mean, that would be that would be such a relief if it was the case. Um, Europe is a bit more wary about capitalism than America is, and we've lost our first Chick Fil A in England within a few months, so we don't have that experience yet. But but w whether or not we can depend on capitalism to save us, and if Jeremy Corbyn gets elected in, we certainly can't. <laughs> um, I still think it's the church's to itself to be true to revelation uh, and to speak prophetically to a confused and lost society. And my frustration remains that those of us who are trying to do that are labeled as, as bigots, fundamentalists, uh, dinosaurs, whereas actually what we've done is we've spotted, we've discerned the conflict between the spirit of the age and the Holy Spirit and are speaking biblical truth to power. It's, it's, and we've been without let up because the more we can manage to find the courage to do this, the more chance there is that other Christians will scratch their heads and say, oh, wow, I see. Uh, I, I really hadn't got it before. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to do with this program. May I, may I take this in a slightly different direction, uh, but it, it follows upon what Gavin and uh, you have been saying, Kevin. One of our viewers contacted me. Uh, I mentioned uh, we discussed last week the, the uh, free fall of attendance of the Anglican Church of Canada and how for almost a generation they've not released statistical information. And I said perhaps they just didn't collect it or incompetent or whatnot. And we had a... Uh, believe a church warden contact me and say no we we turn in every little bit of infinite information uh, attendance statistical financial they have just chosen the national church to hide this information because if they don't hide it then the world would see that the course they have taken is unsustainable it's a fraud it's bad it's bad practice in essence that the Anglican Church of Canada leadership has coerced the market of ideas, co coerced the market of ideas and information to prevent the truth from being told. We have that in the Episcopal Church. Um, there are many Episcopal churches that are growing greatly, uh, at going leaps and bounds. None of those churches are ever highlighted by the National Church or the evangelism offices or anything like that, or ever asked, how are you doing this? My church is the fastest growing church in the Diocese of Central Florida. For five years, we've grown on average between 10 and 12 percent. In other words, this is not a bubble. We just add people year in, year out. And during that same period, our population has only grown about 1 percent. So it's not that everybody moved into town. Do you think the Diocese of Central Florida or the National Church has any interest in how many people show up at my church? None. And I think the only reason why I can say is that instead we get missives from Orlando and from New York about how to attract and how to do this and how to do that. And nobody asks the successful churches in Dallas or in Orlando or across the United States, how are you doing this? Because they have an idea and they don't want any facts to disrupt this idea that the progressive agenda is the future. Well, if you go back half a generation, the Episcopal Church had the decade of evangelism. I think it was in the 90s, late 90s, or, uh, and they didn't grow at all. No, no, that's not true, Kevin. Did they grow? What? Th that is not true. Okay. During, the, deca uh, that, um, during the decade of evangelism, mm -hmm. before the Gene Robinson crisis, the Episcopal Church was the only mainline denomination, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Methodists, so on and so forth, that either grew slightly or maintained its numbers. Good. During the 90s, under, God help me for saying this, under Frank Griswold, 
the Episcopal Church adopted a live and let live strategy. Mm -hmm. And by having this live and let live strategy, you had successful dynamic growth in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a Rust Belt area. Pittsburgh should be dying, but Pittsburgh under Bob Duncan was doing well. Very well. It was only in the aftermath of the Gene Robinson affair when we had the mass secessions and then under the basically criminal regime of Catherine Jefford Shorey, did the Episcopal Church break its tradition of accommodation to all schools and become a monolithic hate fest. No, I agreed. I want to get back to a point you mentioned as well when you talked about the the, um, capitalism and stuff like that. You mentioned that social media was, you know, our strife, and it really is. Because places like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name the social media, it's run by liberal progressives who don't want free speech at all and have stopped conservatives and stopped moderates and stopped uh, feminists and others who have some reason to say, wait a minute, this is going too far. And it's a blocking uh, technology where you're no longer allowed to have a voice. One day, maybe Anklon Scripted will be blocked from YouTube and blocked from Facebook. It hasn't happened yet. But everybody signs on to it. Everybody goes to Facebook every day, Instagram every day. How you forget, you? Kevin, we're blocked in Pakistan. We are blocked in Pakistan. Yeah, <laughs> and darn them all. But That happened after we printed the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. The Pakistanis right. shut us but off. What happens when Anklon Unscripted one day gets shut off? You know, we are a voice of reason within the Anglican Church. Um, that is a fear I have every uh, morning when I wake up. I want to see if I get a message from YouTube saying your content uh, violates our policy. You know, that's a sad day coming. And the thing is, if they can do it to someone like Jordan Peterson, mm-hmm. who is the platform, who is probably the most, I would say, popular, eminent public intellectual of a conservative bent in the West today. That's maybe an overstatement, but it's certainly true in the United States. Jordan Peterson is under constant attack from being Mm. platformed, of not allowing his videos to be shared or sold, uh, of universities refusing to extend to him invitations. They extend to former uh, current uh, Islamic terrorist leaders. If they can do it to someone with a profile like Jordan Peterson, it just takes a flick of the wrist to do that to something like Anglican Unscripted. Mm. Gentlemen, well, and I think uh, much that I'd like. Go finish up, Kevin. Much though I'd like to agree, <laughs> um, the, the 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 banking system ought to be a place where capitalism rules rules. Uh, but I'm going to a meeting later on this week, which is going to draw together a number of Christians in the city of London who want to explore trying to find Christian bank, to found a Christian bank because of the fear. Because of the demonetizing, for example, of Jordan Peterson, and I'm sure everyone, the conservative commentators, PayPal and YouTube have have simply cut them off from their funding. Uh, Christian concern, uh, 10 years ago, when it tried to open a bank, was told by a major high street bank, um, we don't want, we may not want to give you an account because your aims and purposes will upset our Islamic customers ago. So one of the problems we have is is finding the ground cut from under our feet, uh, not just in terms of access to YouTube and social media, but but equally seriously in the world of finance. I I I, I love George's optimism, and I'm and I'm impressed by the American gung ho spirit and and wedded to capitalism. But I fear, particularly in Europe, the capitalism alone won't save us. Jesus and freedom of speech alongside capitalism, too. So it's really a matter of not being complacent in any kind of way. Kevin, over to you. Okay. I need to do a sign out. If you can hear in the background a hairdryer, that's my wife getting ready to go. And we have to go do our vacation activities out there in Disneyland. Uh, I think Space Mountain will be part of that. I hope. We'll see. Uh, Until next time, uh, hopefully Friday we'll have a show. We'll see if the internet allows that. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and for the moment, you still get to listen to episode 551 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm-hmm.